I know, I, I I didn't text him back, but I feel like I know, it, it, I'm totally cool with that. If you wanna help out with family, so it's fine. Alright. So, um the big goal today is to discuss how does HPV replicate its genome. Uh, and this really leads into the conversation of talking about cancer as well. Um, the one slide I, for, I didn't finish up with on Monday, or yeah, Monday, was to talk about E2 does more than just regulate, um, well, I guess this kind of goes along with its role of regulating splicing. But one comment to make here is that we talked about on Monday the secession of those different genes that get expressed during different points of the life cycle. So, for example, early on, E2 levels are low. We've got E6 and E7 being expressed. Um, and at some point, when levels of E2 get really high, what we find is that it actually starts to shut off the expression of E6 and E7. And we start to find expression of some of those late early genes, E4 and E5, and then also the, the capsid proteins L1 and L2. So E2 is a really big regulator in this process of what genes get expressed and when does it happen. And again, it's an interplay between E2 and host proteins that are contributing to this. That's kind of the big theme. And then again, the alternative splicing. That's really what we covered on, on Monday. So today is transitioning to the, the, the rest of the biosynthesis process. Really, how do we get viral genome to be replicated early and then also later on in the process? Most of what we're going to talk about is what's happening in the early stages of infection now. Okay. Um, note that in these early stages, all that's going to be happening is that the viral genome is being maintained. In other words, each time a cell divides, we get two daughter cells, each with uh, a copy of the genome. Hey, Brenda. Apparently she wasn't partying with Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and then later on in the process, what we have is basically an explosion of replication later on. So at this point, host replication has pretty much ceased, but the virus is still encouraging synthesis of the viral genome at this point. Sabrina. So E2 functions in part as a transcription factor, but really it's, it, and, and it does so by binding to that URR uh, or the LCR region where the promoters are located, but it also is functioning as a splicing factor as well. And I think, the, I think that there's quite a bit still about E2 that we don't know about, which is why this seems a bit wishy-washy. Okay. All right, so viruses, ones that need access to DNA polymerase. How do they do it? How does a virus that needs access to the host DNA polymerase get access to it? That's one. It has to be in the nucleus. S phase is the second part. So something about this virus has to encourage a cell to going into cycling. And that's what leads to warts. That's what leads to cervical cancer, which is, is Friday's topic. So we can think of warts as being like a benign tumor. A tumor is any, th any abnormal cellular growth. Benign meaning it's not a cancer. Um, HPV triggers this, and this growth here represents that, that proliferation of these cells that are supporting the life cycle of, of HPV. So somehow it has to force it into S phase. Um, the major two proteins, to make a long story short, are E6 and E7. Okay. So here's the cell life cycle in, in brief. Remember from Gen Bio 1 or 2, I never remember which one of those two courses because it just continually changes how we're teaching those two. But G1, initial growth phase. If cells are blocked from going into synthesis, this is where they go into that G0 or resting phase. Now we've got S, which is synthesis. Here's where we find expression of DNA polymerase. We find expression of 
other enzymes that are going to help to produce nucleotide triphosphates. And then as replication or as DNA replication ceases, there's a second growth phase, a checkpoint right before M, and then we've got mitosis and a checkpoint in here as well. And note I'm using the term checkpoint. There are multiple checkpoints along the way in which a cell checks to make sure is it ready to proceed to the next part of the cycle. So for example, in mitosis, there's a checkpoint to make sure that the chromosomes are lined up correctly on the metaphase plate. In G2, there's a check to make sure that is all the, are all the chromosomes replicated, is the sequence correct. There's a checkpoint right here at G1 as well. And this is the one that's being controlled. Cells don't usually just begin S phase or continue to go through this cycle. Most often, cells are going to halt at G1 unless they've got some sort of growth factor. So um, we won't get into the details of this. This is more cell bio than anything else. But one of the things that we find is, for example, if we have EGF, epidermal growth factor, not EGP, epidermal growth factor, if EGF binds onto the epidermal growth factor receptor, or EGFR, on cells, that triggers a signal transduction pathway, a kinase cascade. And ultimately, the end result is to increase the expression of what we call the cyclins. Okay. The main one we're looking at is today, and we'll come back to this one, actually, is cyclin D. Cyclin D binds to two different cyclin-dependent kinases, CDK4 and CDK6. When these bind to each other, when a cyclin binds to a CDK, it activates the CDK and it promotes transition from G1 into S phase. So let me draw out how this occurs. Yeah, absolutely. Can I draw and repeat it? Sure. Okay. So I'm thinking it might help if we actually talk about how does this activation occur. So I'll draw a cell surface here. Here is our receptor, so our EGFR. And EGF being a hormone that's going to be released to, to bind to this receptor and trigger a signal transduction pathway. And in, this, in essence, these pathways are ones where uh, one protein activates the next, so on and so forth. Ultimately, the end result of this pathway is in the nucleus. We will find activation of transcription of the cyclins. And as the name implies, these cyclins, their levels increase and decrease throughout the cell cycle. Okay. So when a cyclin is produced, it's going to bind to a cyclin-dependent kinase. Cyclin-dependent kinases are, often, are present in the cell in an off state. So they're always expressed but the default is to be off. And assume this middle here would be our active site. Okay. So when a cyclin binds to a CDK, it binds like an allosteric activator. So what's an allosteric activator or allosteric inhibitor or non-competitive inhibitor? What are the functions of those? This is going back to micro. Good. Yeah, it changes the shape of the enzyme, and in this case, since, since cyclins function as allosteric activators, they change it in a way so that this active site now becomes open and accessible for the substrates of the cyclin-dependent kinases. So when this binding occurs, we find a change in the shape of those CDKs. So that now that act, active site is accessible. 
So now it can perform its activity. Now, I forced micro to one time remember what a kinase is. What's a kinase? Phosphorylate stuff, right? And that's exactly what happens here. Grace, does this help to answer the question? We're going to go ahead and talk now about how this phosphorylation event promotes the cycling. But I want to make sure that I've answered your question beforehand. So, so what I kind of left off was cyclin D binds to CDK4 and CDK6 and when it binds, Yeah, and that's exactly what we just modeled. Okay. So when a cyclin binds to, and when cyclin D binds to CDK4 or CDK6, takes it takes that cyclin dependent kinase from an off to an on state. And now we're going to talk about how does that on state promote this transition. Okay. Two main f players in this process. One of them, actually more than two, but the major one actually is PRB, or retinoblastoma protein. Um, retinoblastoma is what we describe as a tumor suppressor, and most tumor suppressors, their function is to halt cell cycling, or to block cell cycling. So RB, or PRB, is a target for cyclin-dependent kinases. And RB is normally found, it's a nuclear protein. It's found bound to a transcription factor known as E2F. We'll come back to the function of E2F in a minute. But what's going to happen is our cyclin-dependent kinase with the cyclin Bind to RB, phosphorylate it. So RB goes from what we call a hypophosphorylated state, or you'll see this sometimes in articles, to a hyper or phosphorylated state. When it phosphorylates PRB, PRB changes shape. The phosphates in this case function like allosteric repressors or inhibitors. They change the shape of RB in a way so that it no longer can bind to E2F. E2F's function, promote the transition from, S, or from G1 to S phase. When E2F is unbound by PRB, it has the ability to bind to RNA polymerase, and now will drive transcription and ultimately translation of genes like DNA polymerase, uh, other kinases that are going to be involved in creating the deoxynucleotide triphosphates. So this is that actual transition. Okay. Amelia. So it's, yeah, you can assume like this here, this DNA fragment is a promoter region, and there would be some, you could put any of like 20 or 30 different genes downstream of this, essentially. So it's binding to numerous regions of the genome. And once RB is unbound, now you can find recruitment of the RNA polymerase and driving of expression. Sabrina. So does RNA polymerase recognize E2F in there? Yeah, it does. It does. So there's a lot of... I mean, we've talked a bit about how self-assembly occurs with viral capsids, how these proteins just kind of come together at high concentrations. Those interactions, those hydrogen bonds, some of the hydrophobic interactions that are driving that binding are the same that are driving the interactions between RB and E2F, or cyclin-dependent kinase and RB, or RNA polymerase and E2F itself. Other questions? I know this is a lot, and I'm going to guess that for some this is new information. So I want to make sure that we answer all the questions that we have right now. Go ahead. So this specifically is what, like, the gas Yeah. This is, the, this is one of the main events that allow for a cell to transition from G1 into S phase. Exactly. 
So you can start to see here where, and I just want to sidetrack real quick into like the idea of cancer real quick. You can see where there might be mutations to proteins that can promote the proliferation of cells. PRB is a tumor suppressor. Mutations that affect its binding to E2F would allow for cells to go into, into S phase without even having cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases present. Uh, Grace than Annie. I didn't have my Annie. Oh, I thought you did. I'm sorry. Annie. So would an increase in cyclins increase cell division? Yes. Yeah, so increase in cyclin or, um, or constitutive expression, meaning being expressed in the absence of a growth factor, which we do find in some cancers, would lead to just continual cell growth. Now cells that we have growing in cell culture, some of them have mutations in these types of proteins that allow them to grow independently of growth factors. Okay, so like HeLa cells that are one of the most ubiquitous uh, cell lines on the face of the earth grow through mechanisms through mutations like these. Sabrina. So if the epidermal growth factor starts with protein, does the virus that's a good question. That's actually a really good thought. No is the short answer, but it has a different mechanism. So what are other ways that this could occur? Just looking at what we find here, it's not the growth factor. What, could, what else is involved or what else could E637 affect to promote that transition from G1 to S? Why don't, here, we'll do this. Why don't you take two minutes? No idea is off the table, okay, of what could be done by either E6 or E7 in this pathway right here to promote the transition from G1 to S phase. Okay, come up with an idea with a partner. I'm thinking it binds RB, so RB can't bind E2F. That's a great idea as well. So bind RB, change its shape in a way so that it's no longer able to bind. So E7 or E6 functions like an allosteric repressor in some ways. That's a great idea. We actually have seen that with other viruses that we've looked at already. Uh, I think like adenovirus, when we were talking about the 100K protein blocking, uh, what was that, phosphorylation of EIF4E all the way at the beginning of the semester. That was a mechanism that was used. Others? Sabrina? Maybe it's like a transcription factor for the cyclins? So you're saying that maybe E7 promotes the transcription of this, allowing for the cyclins and CDKs to still phosphorylate. Great idea. All good possibilities. And actually, that is a mechanism used by some viruses. Not this one, but definitely some that have to promote cell cycling. Any others? These are all really good ideas. Um, unfortunately, none of them are the actual mechanism. But that's okay. We tried, right? Closest one, actually, is binding to, E2, uh, binding to RB. What we find instead is that E7 actually binds to E2F. So here's some data from 2002 in which a couple of researchers were trying to understand the function of E2F, and uh, here they're referring it to as E2F1. There's like three or four of them. Uh, GST uh, tagged E2F, or I'm sorry, GST tagged E7, and the 16 here refers to HPV 16, which is one of the two most common in, the, in cancer formation. And then they flag tagged E2F. Uh, what kind of experiment are we looking at? Mm -hmm. Western blot. If they're looking for protein protein interaction, what are they doing before this? Yeah, immunoprecipitation is the most likely one here leading into that. So you can see they're doing a Western for alpha flag. In other words, they're, they're doing a Western blot for E2F, but they're immunoprecipitating the GST or what's bound to E7. So this first lane here, 
There's no E7 Express. They're just looking for, will they pull down any E2F alone? Obviously, they don't. Second lane, pull E7 out of solution. What comes with it? E2F. All right. So let's use this, then, as a model. Let's go back to here. E7's binding to E2F. How does this promote cell cycling? What's that? Absolutely. Competes with RB for binding. So if E7 is able to compete with RB, that still allows for E2F to be recognized by the RNA polymerase to allow for this transition from G1 into S phase to occur. Freaking awesome. Freaking awesome. Okay. How would we test that, though? How would you test this competition? So if we wanted to know that E7 competes with RB for E2F, how would we actually test that? That's a great idea. That's a, so let's kind of mock this up real quick. So taking what Amelia said, and we'll, we'll start with just what you said, and then we'll add on to it, Amelia, okay? So take E7, take E2F, take RB. Let's say we're going to immunoprecipitate out of solution. I don't know. Which one do we want to immunoprecipitate? E2F, that seems like a real one. So we'll IP E2F and then try to detect E7 or, or RB. What kind of controls do we need to include in this experiment? So we'll have one with all three of them, but what else do we need to have? Okay, so one with E2F and RB. And let's say that in that case... After we immunoprecipitate E2F and then we test for RB, let's say that we get a really nice thick band. How would this change if we added, sorry for the crowdy handwriting, E7? What would this look like? Anybody disagree with that? Less RB binding? It seems reasonable. We might be able to do the inverse experiment as well, okay? Use E7 in, and E2F and then try RB and see what the effect is there. Another way you could do this, do a dose response. So increase the amount of E7 in your experiment, and what you'd expect to see is that if there is true competition, over time, that amount of RB that immunoprecipitates with E2F would be decreased, that it's being basically titrated off of E2F. Okay. It's a great idea. The other way we can test this is by gene expression. We can use reporter assays as a way to, to test for this as well. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the next slide, nope, it doesn't take us to that. Uh, you could test for expression of a gene downstream of an E2F dependent promoter and test for, hey, if we increase E7, what does this do to transcription? And we'd expect an increase in transcription as it's competing with RB over that period of time. Okay. Questions on the function of E7, how we can detect its interaction with E2F? Okay. If you transfect just E7 into cells, in other words, if you take human uh, fibroblasts and you put E7 into them to stably express it, those cells actually don't just begin to proliferate uncontrollably. They will for a little bit, but actually they die very quickly as well. And so what this says is that E7 is required for promoting cell growth, but it's not sufficient. There needs to be another protein present, and that is, in this case, E6. 
So E6 has a similar, albeit slightly different function. And these two functions of E6 and E7 actually converge on each other, but there's also a distinction for E6 as well. So that takes us to this other, um, this other protein here, P53. P53 is probably the most well-studied tumor suppressor protein on the face of the earth. It, that would be my argument, at least. P53 has a lot of roles. It blocks G1 to S transition. It actually blocks G2 to M transition as well. P53 recognizes DNA damage. It also is a major regulator of cyclin-dependent kinases. And the way that it does it is by activating, when P53 is active, it functions as a transcription factor to activate what we call CKIs, or cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. Right? And there are three or four major ones. There's P21, there's P16, and then there's another one known as P27. The names of them are not important. Just know that what we're looking at is P53 activates the transcription and ultimately the translation of the cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors, or CKIs. As the name would imply, what do these do? They inhibit what? Cyclin-dependent kinases. In other words, they block cell cycling. All right. Um, the way that they do is they will actually compete with the cyclin for changing the shape of the cyclin-dependent kinase. When cyclin, when cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors are present, they win out. Their effect is more strong in inhibiting cell cycling than as the effect of cyclins in activating cell cycling. So if we block these cyclin-dependent kinases, therefore we're going to block that G1S transition. We block phosphorylation of RB. We block the ability of E2F to be recognized by RNA polymerase. We block transcription of genes required for synthesis. Given this, anybody want to take a guess as to how E6 works? Let's brainstorm again. Let's take a minute or so. How does E6 function to block this process? You looking ahead? No. Sabrina. I thought you were better than that. <laughs> All right, how does this occur? Let's, let's brainstorm a couple of ideas. Yeah, of course she did. <laughs> how does this process occur? Or how could it occur? Okay, so blocks P53. In this case, it would block P53 from activating transcription, maybe, prevent P21 from being produced. Great idea. Others? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you if it's right or wrong. Huh? Cheater? What did they do? I didn't look that far. I did just says E6 inhibits P53. Well, that, okay, good. <laughs> True. Annie? I was going to say, does it just go straight to the P21 or the P16? That could be a function. It could, you could say, like, hey, it's going to bind to P21 and prevent it from, from interacting with cyclin-dependent kinases. That's definitely a potential mechanism. It's not the right one in this case. The interaction truly is between E6 and P53, but it's not just binding. Actually, what happens here is E6 binds to what's known as a ubiquitin ligase known as E6AP or E6 activating protein. What 
is ubiquitous. Anybody know this? I don't know if you guys would learn this at all. Yeah, I, I, I guess. What's that? That's ubiquitous known, actually. That's that's a really keen, uh, keen thought. But Annie, yeah. So the main function of ubiquitins, or at least one of the main functions, is to lead to the degradation of proteins. Ubiquitin is kind of like a marker. Um, apparently, I can this up. But what happens is that. There are three proteins that are part of what we call ubiquitin ligase chain. Um, that is really not important. What is important is that when a protein becomes what we say polyubiquitinated, yes, it is a made up word by scientists. Mm -hmm. But when we get these long chains of ubiquitin, what this serves as is a signal to the cell that this protein here needs to be sent to the proteasome, it's going to be broken down or destroyed. So by E6 recruiting E6AP to, the, to P53, it leads to the ubiquitination, it leads to degradation of P53, and that's ultimately going to block the expression of those cyclodependent kinase inhibitors. Okay. The other thing to point out here, now, now I think that it becomes quite apparent, or at least it does to me, I hope it does to you as well, where this then helps to activate cycling in addition to E7's role in activating cycling. There's an additional thing that it does though. P53, if it recognizes DNA damage or other alterations to the cell, it can induce cell death or apoptosis. This protein, E6, is absolutely required for transformation of cells with E7. I said that E7 alone will lead to cell death. Well, that's because P53 is still active. E6 needs to be around to inactivate P53 in order for those cells to remain viable. Annie. So E6 binds to the ubiquitin ligase, which then polyubiquitinates P53. Yep, yep. <laughs> okay. Yep, exactly. Okay, wait. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want me to, do you, I need to walk through it again? Okay. So E6AP is the actual protein that is adding these ubiquitins to P53. E6 activates, e activates it. it polyubic one of its targets is P53. P53 becomes ubiquitinated, something like that. And gets destroyed. Please. The P21 can't be made. Exactly. Okay. And so without P53, like you said, P21 can't be made. So now that allows for any time the cyclins are, are present, there's no, no longer a transition into that G0 phase. The cell's going to go directly from S, uh, G1 into S phase at that point. Okay. All right, that's a lot of information, but that's the bulk of what I wanted to get through today, okay? So let's, just, let's start with this. Two main roles, E6 and E7. Can somebody describe what the combined role of the two of them is? So let's, kind of, let's take a step back from these details and let's look at this holistically. What is the function of E6 and E7? Grace. Um, to get the cell, well, to get the virus into S phase. Okay, to get the cell into S phase, and what does that provide for the virus? DNA polymerase. Provides DNA polymerase. 
this is the biosynthesis pathway. Okay. So the main goal is trigger cell division, or sorry, trigger S phase, so that that viral genome can get be replicated. Sabrina. So you said Six. Yeah. So, have they done experiments like with that alone? Yes. And E6 does seem to be able to promote cellular growth on its own. If I'm not mistaken, of the two of them, E6 is thought to be more important um, for promoting cell growth and for blocking cell death. Because it can do both through its regulation of P53, um, E6 is thought to be kind of like the major one in this process. And actually, if we look at cervical cancers, and this is something we'll talk more, we'll get to in more on Friday. If I have to double check on this, but there's something that sits in my mind from 13 years ago, sitting in a cancer bio class, saying that if you look at cells that are HPV positive, or cancer cells that are HPV positive, more frequently you will find E6 in those cells than you will find E7 in those cells. So if you break it down into those that are HPV positive, I'll just kind of mock up some numbers real quick. Let's say like 60% of the time you find E7 and E6 DNA suggesting there's a selection for these two together. Maybe 30% of the time, you're going to find just E6, and then maybe 10% of the time, you'll find just E7. And that says that the two of them together give the greatest likelihood for carcinogenesis. E6 alone has some effect, but is not as good as both of them. E7, this is a rare occurrence. Okay, let's do a review question with the last 10 minutes today, all right? What? All right, real quick, also, um, what we're transitioning to, I want to give a quick heads up so that I don't forget to mention this. On Friday, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how does HPV ensure that when a cell divides, its chromosome or its plasmid is also divided equally to those daughter cells. And then we'll start to talk about cancer. What that means is then, I've been kind of debating what we were going to do on Monday. We're going to continue to talk about HPV. We'll actually talk about other viral cause cancers as well. And now you have all the information to do the critical thinking for Monday. Okay? So not, you don't need any more information than what you've got already for it. All right. So let's take a look at this review question, and we'll try to get through what we can with it. Um, so this says you transfect a plasmid expressing either just E6, just E7, or both of those proteins into a non-immortalized cell line of human epithelial cells. Non-immortalized means that they can only replicate so many times before they stop replicating. You perform two different experiments. Western blots to detect total PRB, phosphorylated PRB, E6 and E7, so four different Western blots. And then reporter assays using GFP as an indicator of transcription from a promoter regulated by E2F. Mock up the results. From, the, from these four conditions, you should probably also include one that has none of, just an empty plasmid, right? Um, and then just... I think most everybody did the Western blot, so why don't we just, let's just talk about these results. Um, what do we expect to happen? And, and by this I mean, again, what's the function of E6 and what's the function of E7 here? Does E7 phosphorylate RB? No. It doesn't. And so we might anticipate that what might happen is, well, first, we might anticipate total RB levels are going to remain the same. We didn't say anything about these proteins repressing RB in any way, shape, or form. So we'd expect those levels to remain the same. 
we might expect that with E7 present, maybe there will be just a little bit of RB phosphorylated. Or if you drew nothing, that's fine as well. It's all relative. Okay. What would we expect in the control? One with nothing present at all. Maybe a little bit as well. I mean, there's always some PRB phosphorylated in a population of cells. What's the function of E6? It's going to inhibit P53. That's going to allow for activation of cyclin-dependent kinases. And what do they do? They phosphorylate PRB. So we might expect that when E6 is around, we've got phosphorylated protein, or at least more than we detect in the control, and more than we detect in E7 alone. Now what about with both of these proteins at the same time? Probably same results as what we see with just E6. Okay. So if you have something that is somewhat like this, you're in good shape. You understand the interaction between E7, P53, and RB, and E6. Um, we'll, we'll mock up some of the transcriptional results on Friday. So if anything, review this material, because um, I think this, is kind of, this was kind of a hefty day, all right? All right, have a great afternoon. I'll see you all Friday.